Hello, yes. <laughs> so welcome. Uh, welcome to this international music, dance, and art festival benefiting the Institute for Religious Tolerance, Peace, and Justice. Uh, my name is Damien Kevitt. Uh, I'm a volunteer with the Institute and a great fan of the amazing work that Dr. Eric Greenberg does both in Southern California and around the world. Now, I want to kick off by a show of hands. Um, how many of you have attended one of the interfaith marches that the Institute has put on every year? Virtually. virtually, yes, virtually counts. Hey, good, that's awesome. Well, for those who have not attended one of the interfaith marches, I highly recommend that you do so. Let us know your uh, email address. Get on, the, get on the newsletter and get notified of the next one. Um, because they're truly phenomenal. They're just great, great events, virtually and uh, in person. Hopefully the next one will be in person. Uh, is that right? We're, we're hoping that's the case? Good. Now this, this event is a new type of event um, for us at the Institute. It's a live, virtual sort of fusion event. And I want to welcome everyone who's sitting at home uh, watching this event. So hello everyone sitting at home. Um, and our live audience, we are really, really excited to have you here as our live audience uh, in person. Isn't this great that we can be in person again? Um, live audience, I want you to welcome our virtual audience. Give them a wave. Yeah, great. <laughs> awesome. Um, now, when we first started planning for this event, uh, it was planned that the audience would only be virtual. Um, we had no idea if we'd be allowed to have any um, live audience at all, and we're thankful that we are now at a point in the pandemic where we're able to have a live audience, although limited. And I think the artists are also very thankful to be able to have a live audience, to be able to play for you. I'm thankful to be able to have that interaction, okay? So on behalf of me and the artists, thank you. But we have to make an agreement. Because you are a limited live audience, that we, this is what we are allowed to have in here, you are gonna have to make up for the fact that you're limited by being extra loud and excited for all of the performers, agreed? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay, yes. good. Uh, for everyone watching, both virtually and live, there are a lot of performers packed into the next two hours. Um, your eyes and ears will be delighted by no less than 15 different musicians, dancers, and spoken word artists from all coming all together in support of the mission of the internet of the and international activities of the Institute for Religious Tolerance, Peace, and Justice. Uh, for those who are virtual. Um, to help you find out more about the artists, we are going to be posting in the chat um, information about every single artist. Uh, for live, you have your programs in front of you there, or if you haven't picked one up, you can pick one up uh, in the back. But for those virtually, there's gonna be uh, posting as information about each of the performers, including links to their websites and things like that, if you'd like to find out more. Um, you can also ask questions in the Q&A, and we will have uh, there's going to be a couple little points there where there are potentially some questions. We'll see. We'll see how the, how the timing's going on, all of that. But right now, let's get down to business, shall we? Okay. Now, when I mean business, of course, I mean this amazing ensemble we have here behind me. Uh, let me introduce them. Uh, their name is Arohi. Arohi. Literally translated from Sanskrit, Arohi means ascending melody which is a metaphor for the spiritual quest. They bring a unique blend of sitar, woodwinds, cello, tabla, and drums together. Led by Paul Livingstone, Arohi combines Eastern and Western sounds in a new way of cohesive and exciting ragged jazz, chamber music. Now for those like myself who had no idea what ragged jazz is, um, it's a fusion of Indian classical music and contemporary American jazz. 
Um, and really to understand that, you are going to have to listen to them and enjoy. So please welcome Paul Livingstone and Arohi. Thank you so much. We're going to get right to some music. Um, we're going to open with it. Uh, actually, we're just going to play one extended composition uh, that we've uh, specially arranged for today. Um, it's called Nihar. Nihar means tenderness. And uh, I think that's what we need in the world right now for to have inter, interface solidarity. We need more love across across borders, across peoples, across everything. So enjoy this. It's a multi-movement suite based on a rag called Gavati. And you'll hear uh, different counterpoint and improvisations sprinkled out throughout the, the, whole, uh, the whole piece. And then I'll introduce the musicians at the end. Thank you. This is called Nihar, based on rag Gavati. <laughs>
Thank you so much. We're Arohi Ensemble. That's Dave Lewis on drums. Peter Jacobson on the cello. Neelamjeet Dillon on tabla. My name is Paul Livingstone. Thank you so much. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of this amazing afternoon and evening. Thank you. Okay, well, now you all know what ragged jazz is. Are you impressed? Yeah, yeah I am. Um, well, our next performer is a mesmerizing spoken word artist, Santana Sankofa. Uh, Santana is a genderqueer, Afro-Caribbean artist, educator, and community organizer born and raised in Los Angeles and coming to us live from New York City. Um, their art and activism centers on disrupting faith-based, political, and academic institutions, creating programs to activate youth, and empowering queer and ethically non-monogamous folks through the sounds and spaces she cultivates. Please welcome Santana Sankofa. Peace, blessings. I hope everyone can hear me well. I'm so grateful to be spending this Sunday afternoon with you. I am in New York, which is historically Lenape Canarsi land. So I just wanted to bring to mind the indigenous ancestors of the Lenape and Canarsi people who are in Brooklyn and who are based in Brooklyn where I am now. I wanted to center in my piece, um, this short set that I have with you, the idea of moving from despair into hope and moving from grief into healing and how grief and despair, they don't really go away, but it's how we incorporate them into our lived experiences and into our perspective. So the first is a poem that I originally wrote in 2016 and have made some edits since the catastrophes and, and brutalities against Black people in this country and around the world. All I have is words. All I see is Black bodies. Their ashes find a way to the page where I coat their skin in dark ink, where I struggle to immortalize, further struggle to write their names in calligraphy, try and memorize the list of names that make up my history when white men in green print is all I can focus on, is all I'll let myself cry about. Shedding tears won't fertilize the soil they lie under to bring them back. My timeline riddled with badges that plunder and walk away free and parade the bodies fiercely as blood-soaked concrete baptizes blood-drained men. Sometimes I have dreams about being free. Wake up to Langston Hughes' sting. America ain't never been America to me and my people. Daughters stand in front of cameras remembering they daddies, knowing they memories ain't heard. Knowing news teams will swarm at the exhibition of couldn't be facts, at lies told and guns seen and people whose only crime was existing black. I wonder what thought crosses their minds before they go. I wonder if Eric, if George thought something more beautiful than I can't breathe if he met God and felt nothing but peace, if she showed him the future and he saw nothing but hope, if he was supremely happy knowing he was going back home, leaving us here, traumatized, leaving me with sent texts to all the black boys I know, screaming at them when they ain't acting right, shaming them when they turn a corner and leave my sight. Yo, calm down, I'm just trying to live my life. I never asked you to fear for me. I'm learning to love, but not so loud. I'm learning to kiss and then let go. I'm learning to let my mind wander to things of the Trinity, to black doves anointing with fire, to black people cleansing their cities with flames. Their ashes find a way to the page where I coat their skin in dark ink, where I struggle to immortalize for their struggle to watch them return to dirt for the earth, just like my mama preached. Remember you are dust and to dust you shall return. She smears their bodies above my brow on a Wednesday night and I feel chosen. And I feel as though we will live on. Thank you. As I prepare for this next piece, 
I just wanted to center um, the fact that the violence does not go away. The fact that the famine and the war and the disease, these are things that we live with every day. And maybe we're blessed to not face them personally, but that vibration that is entered into this world when people are oppressed, when people are not given the voice or the means to survive, that is something that we are constantly combating, even if it's just energetically from hundreds of miles away. We're nowhere near Palestine, but Palestine is in our hearts and it's in my heart as I sing this next song. This is from an upcoming EP um, and it talks about the, the aspiration for divinity. So if you've ever felt like, where is God? Why does God feel so far away? How do I get there? Um, this song is, is walking me through that process. And it's called, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shining like the leaves, magnolia. How can I get closer to you? Yeah. Feels like you're further than the star serious. Mystics say you're inside. Are they serious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wrestling with God in the desert now. South Central ain't known a day without the drought. Meanwhile in Brooklyn, you know I stay drowned. A hood is a hood, so I find my way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I wonder if spirit can hear my songs. I wonder who wrote them, cause I ain't the one. No shame, I know she likes her vessel strong. No guilt, I gave it all up to God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Next time the burden weighs you down, leave it at the altar, please put it down. Let your load be light, don't make a sound. Don't look up, there's no heaven in the clouds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paradise is within. Forgetting you are divine is the only sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paradise is within. Forgetting you are divine is the only sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paradise is within. Forgetting you are divine is the only sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paradise is within. Forgetting you are divine is the only sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you all so much for this space and time. I hope you enjoy the rest of the performers and your lovely time together. Thank you so much. Peace. Thank you, Santana. That was awesome. Truly beautiful. One more just round of acknowledgement. For this. Okay. Devin Katrina is a Latin dance star and singer songwriter. Having studied dance around the world for the past 15 years, she has danced in music videos for many internationally known artists. Her love of Afro-Latin dance and music exemplifies her unique style of dance fusion. As an all-around musician, Devin uses her unique ear 
to also write and perform her fusion of Afro-Latin music from around the world. Please welcome dancer, singer, and songwriter, Devin Katrina.
Okay, I, I want to do another round of acknowledging because I didn't get to participate in that last one. Thank you so much. That was truly, truly beautiful. All right, well, we are moving on to our next performer, coming to us virtually. Uh, he was born in Lebanon and raised in Syria. Faisal is an Arabic percussionist dedicated to preserving and teaching Arabic music and drumming. He's been teaching and performing Arabic and Middle Eastern music since 1991. Faisal teaches private lessons, workshops, seminars, and music camps across the United States and abroad. Please welcome Faisal. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation and for putting this uh, great event together. Um, I have one song I prepared I would like to uh, share with you, <clears throat> and uh, I will be doing drumming uh, throughout the song. Uh, basically, it's a song from, uh, from Egypt, and I hope you can hear me well. Uh, a song from Egypt, and uh, it's from the fishermen of uh, the city of Port Said, and the, I believe it's on the Mediterranean or the Red Sea. And uh, as you know, like uh, as the rest of the world, whatever uh, coastal cities, they always have their tradition of uh, songs. Fishermen tend to have their own kind of uh, songs. So this song is in a simple 4-4 uh, beat we call Maqsum, <clears throat> sorry. And the uh, melodic mode that it's in, uh, we call Maqam, it's called Maqam Rust. So it's a bit of an Eastern uh, uh, Maqam. Okay, I'm gonna just uh, go ahead and start with the song. I'm 
Okay, uh, how many here, show of hands, how many of here know Dr. Eric Greenberg? Good, okay, so a fair number of you. Well then you probably already know that he's a very humble person that, who speaks softly with a very big scholarly stick. And for those who are not familiar with him, let me introduce. Dr. Greenberg, is a scholar and author serving as the clinical assistant professor of interreligious dialogue at Loyola Marymount University. More importantly, he is the founder of the Institute for Religious Tolerance, Peace, and Justice, which is why we are all here today. Dr. Greenberg received his PhD in religious studies from Claremont Graduate University, Claremont, California in 2005, specializing in New Testament and the religions of the Greco-Roman world with a particular focus on the diversity of belief within early Christianity. Dr. Greenberg has studied a number of world religions, and his academic work bears the footprint of his interfaith background and reflects his desire to foster a model for modern religious tolerance. His personal mission statement is, and I quote, educate the public on religious and political understanding, history and connection through current affairs, and personable, open-minded public interaction bringing us to a better understanding of ourselves and others, and by creating empathy for others, and by, and by creating empathy for others, not deterring people from their own faith, but help broaden one's understanding of the divine work within all human life. Due to his bridge-building work with the Institute, Institute for Religious Tolerance, Peace, and Justice, in 2018, Dr. Greenberg received the 2018 Youth for Human Rights International Award for his dedication to interfaith and social activism. Dr. Greenberg continues to play a pivotal role in uniting people of all religious faiths across the world, both in the classrooms and the world. Please give a huge welcome to Dr. Eric Greenberg. I want to say, is this thing on? But I won't. <laughs> um, I guarantee that I'm not nearly as interesting or entertaining as our performers today, so I will try to keep this part of my uh, presentation somewhat brief so we can get back to uh, seeing and listening to the performers that we have. I'll, uh, I'll save my more lengthy comments till a little bit later when we're going to be introducing some of our international partners. Uh, through, the, uh, uh, through the miracle of Zoom, and we can talk with them for a few minutes. Um, but I want to just uh, say a few words about the Institute. I want to remind you that the Institute for Religious Tolerance, Peace, and Justice mission is to promote religious tolerance, interfaith dialogue, and education about religions of the world as a pathway to world peace. Uh, the Institute, as we call it for short, was founded in 2011 by several scholars and interfaith activists. And over the last decade or so, we have uh, pursued a number of different programs, uh, not least of which is the Interfaith Solidarity March, which we began in 2016, and it has been going every year in Los Angeles since then, uh, even during the pandemic. And some of you have taken part in the, uh, in the street versions of this as well as in the uh, virtual versions. And I am very grateful to all of you for having taken part in that and making it success. Um, We've pulled together a group of really um, dedicated and competent and passionate volunteers over the last several years who have helped the Interfaith Solidarity March to become a really a, a, an amazing event. Uh, but these volunteers are so passionate that they couldn't stop working. And over the last couple of months, uh, several of them had said, well, you know what, the Interfaith Solidarity March is not enough. Let's do another event. Let's do one right on the coattails of the Interfaith Solidarity March. And so here we are, the, uh, the, the origins, the etiology of this event right here, uh, only just a couple of months after our march in the spring. Um, our volunteers said, you know, let's see what we can do to try to uh, entertain our supporters, give them something enjoyable during this year and a half of pandemic, but also to try to raise some funds for the programs that we have. So first and foremost, I want to thank all of the performers who have 
given so generously of their time and energy for this event, uh, the people who have shared spoken word, like Santana, the people who have shared musical uh, performances, like the Arohi Ensemble, and uh, several others that are going to be uh, that are going to be uh, giving of their of their time for us, as well as several of the uh, the, the the dance performances. I want to thank all of them. So let's just briefly have another round of applause for all of these performers. And so without the passion for performing and for the belief in this cause, we wouldn't be here today. So I'm really grateful to all of those people who were passionate enough to come out here and to share with you not just their talents in performance, but also their belief in this mission. Because they certainly could have chosen to be somewhere else today, but they chose to be here. And I appreciate that so much. So I want to thank also the sponsors and supporters of this event who gave of their energy to make this possible, the people who gave monetarily, the people who gave in-kind donations, the people who gave uh, food, the people who gave of their time to, to, to film and produce the event. I want to thank all of them. Um, specifically, I'd like to uh, mention Melissa Crandall, Roxanne Hill, Dolly Bush, Robin Sanders, Vishal Solanke, Olivia McDuff, Rich Prasida, as well as a number of the other volunteers for today's event along with any of the other last-minute production assistants and engineers. So thank you to all of them. I also want to personally thank Father Michael Foley, who is the Rector of Holy Nativity, and um, also to thank the Vestry of Holy Nativity Episcopal Church for their use of this beautiful sanctuary. And we thank them for all the resources and energy that they have devoted to this event. They are true allies of our cause. Thank you. So I mentioned the, uh, the very passionate planning committee that we have, which generally comes together for the march every year, but they are, they are continuing to give up themselves very passionately. Um, this is how they give back to the community. And they give their hearts and souls to a cause that they believe in, and I am very grateful that they believe in the organization that I founded back in 2011. And, you know, I'm thinking a lot about gratitude these days. That's something that's particularly, particularly important to me, particularly present in my life. It's the notion of gratitude. And I'm thinking about how grateful I am for all of the people who have come together to make this day what it is, and that every moment here is unique. Every second, every millisecond is unique, that we won't get back again unless we have a time machine of some sort, but we won't have it again. And I'm grateful for all of the conditions that we're in the right place at the right time to make everything here today what it was. I'm grateful for all of the conditions that came together to make every one of you the people that you are sitting here in these pews. I'm reminded of Fred Rogers. You know who Mr. Rogers was, right? I'm a big fan of Mr. Rogers. and just a truly amazing human being, and probably most of us don't even know half about what he actually was and what he supported. But there was one thing he had said in sort of a meditative way uh, encouraging people to really acknowledge and think about all of the people in their past, all of the people in their heritage, all the people in their genetic makeup that loved you into being, that created you, all the great-grandparents and all the great-great-great-grandparents and all the generations leading down to who you are. And so similarly, I have that in mind, all of the people who loved you into being and brought you here today in this particular moment. It's just phenomenal to think about that, that confluence. And I'm reminded of a concept in Buddhism. I've done a little bit of studying in Buddhism in terms of the larger uh, context of religious studies that I've pursued for air these several decades. There's a concept in Buddhism called pratitya samutpada in the Sanskrit, which essentially we could just kind of, kind of carelessly define or, or interpret as the interrelatedness of all things, how everything sort of comes together, everything is related to everything else. You'll sometimes hear people talk about the conditioned genesis, this is another way that they, they sometimes translate it, or, uh, or dependent origination. You'll, you'll see it in a lot of different textbooks defined in different ways. Different authors about Buddhism talk about it different ways, but I think that just the easiest ways to talk about it is the interrelatedness of all things. And the fact that we're all here 
in this moment, in this time, celebrating things like pluralism, things like peace, things like love, things like respect for other people's conception of the divine, or even the choice to not believe in the divine, since we do have some agnostics in our larger fold of the interfaith movement. You know, that we're all here at this moment in time to, to kind of share in that. And I think this is an incredibly beautiful thing, and I'm just so grateful to all of you and all of your ancestors and all of the people that made you who you are. I'm so grateful to have all of us here today in this moment. I just want to take a half a second to think about that silently. So let me just mention a few other things before we get back to the real entertainment. We have a number of programs that are pursued throughout the year and others that happen annually. We're trying to fund our programs so that we can have the widest possible reach in what we do. And among these programs, of course, is our flagship event, the Interfaith Solidarity March, oh, excuse me, actually, the Interfaith March for Peace and Justice, which is the larger program that it's part of, and I'll, I'll explain why I checked myself there for a second. The LA version of that is the Interfaith Solidarity March LA, which we have been doing since 2016. But the Interfaith March for Peace and Justice, IMPJ, is an international coalition of interfaith marches. And this coalition was begun in 2018 by my friend Greg Davis, who is in Columbus, Ohio. And they invited us to be part of their fold, part of their community of the IMPJ. And then quickly they found out that, you know, this is getting too big. Our little organization in Columbus, Ohio, we don't have the, 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 the personnel, we don't have the vision, the scope to actually govern this, this rapidly expanding movement. And so they turned to us, our little group in LA, and said, you have an international scope and vision. Will you help us? Will you take over the Interfaith March for Peace and Justice and have it be under your umbrella, of your, of, under your corporate umbrella? And we said, yes, please. So since 2019, the Interfaith, the, excuse me, the Institute for Religious Tolerance, Peace and Justice has been the corporate home of the Interfaith March for Peace and Justice, which has approximately two dozen different member marches around the world, which have marched with us with, great, with regularity over the last several years. The largest of these marches, of course, are the Philadelphia Interfaith Walk for Peace and Reconciliation, which has been going on for, I believe, 16 years now. We also have our LA March, which is another one of the, the, the largest marches in the community, but we have just almost two dozen marches elsewhere in the country and also outside of our country. Yes, there are countries outside of our country. Some people kind of forget that. Um, we have about, I believe, seven marches outside of the US. Um, some of these marches are in very economically depressed areas, and some of them are in places that we would consider recently war zones. And so the Institute would like to be able to continue to support these other marches so that they can cover their costs and have a safe and effective march that responds to the specific needs in their particular localities. And I'll talk about these a little bit more later. We often see news reports about things going on in the world, bombings and massacres and genocides, and those of us who have a heart, those of us who have compassion, we wonder, what the heck can we do about this? What can we do? How can we support these people who are half a world away, who are dying? You know, one of my students, is, uh, he, he comes from and lives in Myanmar. And if you're not aware of what's going on in Myanmar, Google it, all right, Google it. Myanmar, revolution, civil war, tremendous corruption going on there. And I was, on a regular basis, Zooming with him, you know, especially when he couldn't, when he couldn't uh, uh, attend class because the, uh, the Burmese government had shut off the internet uh, after the curfew hours had begun to make sure that the people in, in Burma and in Myanmar weren't ready to defy their government. And so here's this young guy, 18, 19 years of age, who just wants to get an education. He can't because they shut the internet off because they were afraid that people would go against what the government wanted them to do. So, you know, I mean, there, there's places all around the world that are suffering like this, and we wonder, what can we do? So the Institute is highlighting ways that you can, in fact, help out, perhaps in small, but in crucial ways. In the spirit of acting locally to have a global impact, 
We're partnering with change makers around the world and interfaith leaders in those very regions so that they can be, they can be more effective in tackling their local issues that are best handled by interfaith leadership and maybe not so much government. Later, we'll hear from a few of our local leaders, particularly two of them in the continent of Africa, about the work that they do. Our partner in Palestine was intending to send a video to us uh, for our incorporation in today's program, Mohammed Jamuz. Um, but his wife is having surgery this week, and I think he's a bit distracted and overwhelmed, so he wasn't able to get us the video in time. So in the future, I will share with you Mohammed Jamuz's work. Uh, but I would ask you to please keep him and his wife and his family in our prayers. Um, even here in the United States, there are communities that need our assistance, but maybe not so much in financial ways in what is the, perhaps the richest country in the world. But these other marches, these communities that we have that are part of our, our fold, our Interfaith March for Peace and Justice community, sometimes they just need to know how better to address the issues of endemic racism, hypernationalism, and religiously motivated violence that we have witnessed on the uptake, excuse me, on the uptick in over the last several years. Sometimes these communities just need a little bit of extra support to figure out how do we deal with that in our locations. We want to know that there are other communities around the United States that are dealing with this too and, and, and are going to support us. So just having partners in other areas to guide and support them in their local programs is very valuable. But we also have programs here in the LA area, such as the Our Muslim Neighbors Forum, which we pioneered actually, I think in 2018, at this very church when Father Peter was still rector. And I want to just briefly say a hello and a welcome. Um, that was the first time we had that event in public. We've had it again once or twice since then, and we'd like to continue that. We also have the Interfaith Ambassadors Program, um, in which we are providing educational experiences to enrich college students, as well as non-collegiate adults, what would the rest of us call grown-ups, um, to help them expose them to religious traditions and ways of life that they might never have come in contact with, further ensuring that they can share with others that they have met a Sikh or a Muslim or a Jew or even a Christian, and that those people, who might be so different from us, whatever our religious traditions are, that they have hopes and dreams and they bleed like the rest of us. And that they are your neighbors and potentially your friends. Who knows if the young man who attends one of these field trips to a mosque and then becomes an officer in the US military will be in a position to have his finger on the button in a war zone where there are innocent civilians within his area of operational responsibility and therefore in his care. After events like the Interfaith Ambassadors Program, hopefully he will be more likely to see these civilians as human beings as opposed to collateral damage, or worse, the enemy. This could be the difference between a Robert Bales and a Chelsea Manning, someone who perpetuates atrocities versus someone who exposes and tries to prevent them. And this little anecdote here is actually taken from, ex from actual experience on my part with a few of my former students, which at some point I can share more about. So if you're convinced of the importance of these programs and of the need to act locally as well as globally, please contribute to the IRTPJ to help support our programs like the grants for the Interfaith March for Peace and Justice, and that's what we'll talk a little bit more about today. And you can donate to the Institute by PayPal or by check. And um, I'm supposed to just kind of briefly mention that if you go to our website, which is just irtpj.org, you will find uh, on pretty much most of the pages, you will find a donate button. So that's the easiest way to donate. So on the main page, donate, and that'll bring you to the PayPal. Or you can go to the Take Action page, which will give you more details about how to mail a check in and what to put on the to line and what address to send it to. It also has a button for donate. So that's one of the, those are the easiest ways to donate. Um, and of course, as a nonprofit organization, all contributions are uh, fully tax deductible to the extent allowed by law. Please consult your local tax accountant. All right. 
So anyway, that's about what I want to say for right now, but I want to uh, turn the microphone back over to Damien Kevitt, our Master of Ceremonies and Director of the event, and I will come back a little bit later on to talk with you a little bit more about some of our interfaith partners and what they are doing in their particular localities and how that plays into the larger program of the Interfaith March for Peace and Justice. So once again, thank you for, for taking the time to join us here today in person in person, this is great. Um, and thank you for buying tickets to this event. Thank you for your support that you have given us so far and in the past. Very grateful for that. Thank you. Okay, and if that inspired any of you to want to be able to help support this more, uh, in the back, uh, Melissa is back there, and if you would like to donate, look right behind you there. You can do additional donations. They've got envelopes, as well as you can do a card right on the spot. For those virtually, just go to IRTPJ.org. IRTPJ.org, hit the donate button, because um, you are supporting a great cause, not just by being here, but if, if you can give more to support all of that, that would be appreciated. Um, okay, you ready for the next performer? Yeah? Okay. I feel like we need to just sort of pump it up a little bit. Remember, we had a deal at the beginning of all of this. Okay, so let me just try that again there. You ready for the next performer? Yes. <laughs> Much better, that was a pass. Okay, good. Uh, our next performers are Caroline McKenzie and Poncho Williams. Uh, Caroline is a singer who holds a bachelor's degree in Romance Languages from Princeton. And if that isn't already impressive enough, she has toured the United States and Europe having been a featured soloist with a long, length, long list of chorals and symphonies. Poncho is a veteran jazz saxophonist performer and teacher for the past 30 years. He is the founder and director of the In the Shed Summer Jazz Camp and is the band leader for his own band, Bonnie's Pearl. Please welcome Ms. Caroline McKenzie accompanied by Poncho Williams. Okay, all right. A little bit of an inside joke here at Rose Chin. I am not, okay. Ah, that, 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 well, it sounds like we can be heard, yeah? yeah. All right, I'm ready. Thank you. 
goes all the way around here. Very good. So those of you who uh, have known me know that I don't like to sing alone. Do I, Dr. Brad? Mm, I think that might be an F. Well, we can just get it from here.
didn't expect to be part of that whole ensemble. It's, I love it when you can, when the audience and the musicians can get involved together and it's, it's a group activity. It's just the best, isn't it? Um, okay, great. Well, we have another amazing performer. Um, this time is a, a virtual performer. Ms. Robin Friend is a first generation Bulgarian American and lifelong dancer. She's one of the most prominent teachers of Iranian dance today, having also published many articles on this form of dance. She's given hundreds of performances as a solo dancer and singer in many prestigious worldwide locations and has students all over the world. She's accompanied today on tar, a Persian guitar, it's called tar, which is a Persian guitar, by her husband, Neil. Please welcome Ms. Robin Friend. Thank you. 
Okay, excellent. So we have a very special performer coming up next. Um, first of all, that was truly amazing. Thank you. There we go. Okay, there we go. Good, excellent. Um, our next artistic duo, Jocelyn and Dawn, explored the crossroads of modern folk and soul. Their debut album, Soar, was released in late 2020 and enjoyed rave reviews nationwide. Jocelyn is the founder of a women's global fusion band called Adawe, which has toured the U.S. numerous times. Dawn is a multi-instrumentalist composer and producer who also serves as the film editor for the animated series The Simpsons. Please welcome Jocelyn and Dawn. Thank you so much for having us. We're really blessed to be here. Uh, Facebook reminded me that it had been 10 years since we did our show here. Uh, we did an artist residency. And it's, it was 10 years ago this day. <laughs> so it's high time to be back. <laughs> Um, this first song is for all of you out there coming out of our cocoons, embracing the world again. Being in front of live people. Yay. This is fun. This is, uh, it's time to light our spark again. Change quick as the seasons Ain't no rain 
Uh, this next one goes out to all of you who are fighting to make this world a better place. And there's so many of you. This is Storm.
Thank you so much. Uh, we have one more for you. And this is um, about bridging those divides that separate us. And uh, we're very honored to play for this great organization that's doing just that. So please give it up for Don Barroso. That was exciting. <laughs> that was the uh, last part of the storm piece that was working on there. <laughs> All right, good. Are you guys enjoying yourself so far? Good. And I hope everyone at home also feels the same. Um, our next uh, performer is originally from New England as a young dancer, Tina was inspired by the historical Mesopotamian poet and priestess, uh, Enheduanna, 
and took her name with great respect for the writer's lifelong dedication to her art. Her dedicated Egyptian-style dance performance and in, as an instructor and performer for over 25 years. She has performed in Taunton venues all over both the East and West Coast. Please welcome, virtually, Ms. T Tina Edhedwana.
Have a wonderful show. Thank you. Well, that was amazing. Yeah. Uh, we, we were chatting in the back, and, and uh, one of the people I was chatting with back there, he's like, wow, she's got moves. <laughs> All right. Um, well, we are coming to the close. We have a couple more uh, performers coming up tonight. But I want you to take a moment and to think Who's been your favorite so far? Who's been your favorite performer so far? Lean next to someone next to you there and, and tell them who's your favorite. Or if you're, if you're at home virtually, uh, write it in the chat. Write in the chat, who is your favorite so far? Did you do that? Yeah? Good. Pretty cool, huh? We've had some amazing performers. I, I am thoroughly impressed. Um, so as you all know, this is a benefit concert for the Institute for Religious Tolerance, Peace, and Justice, which is a beautiful organization with local roots and international scope. Every one of you, by being part of this festival here, live and virtually, is helping to support the Institute. Hopefully during this festival, you are of course thinking about other ways you could help support the Institute and the great work that it does, right? Good, excellent. Well, to help you with those thoughts, to assist you, to think more about that, I'd like to bring back to the stage Dr. Eric Greenberg with a few guests of his own. Please welcome Dr. Eric Greenberg. Thank you very much. Um, I want to talk to you about some of our, um, our partners. This seems extraordinarily loud. I don't know if that's the case or not, or if it's just me, but... Um, some of the partners that I've been talking about earlier in the particular countries that host some of our member marches, I just want to share with you a little bit about some of these fantastic people. Um, one who actually, just off the top of my head, who uh, really stands out is Sylvia Achan, who is from Gulu, Uganda. She's the founder of Golden Women International, and she is a former captive under the Joseph Kony movement, the Lord's Resistance Army, some of you have heard of them. Um, I don't even know how to describe them. You can just Google that. Um, she uh, survived a horrible treatment under that regime and focuses now on educating women and fortifying the rights of women through her organization, Golden Women International. She also leads the march in Uganda. So she's somebody who, um, in fact, I had reached out to her, but I don't think I gave her enough time to send us some videos. But she's somebody that I'd like to uh, emphasize her work uh, for you in the future. I also want to mention uh, Hussein Ali of Jammu Kashmir in India. Uh, his organization is CEEO India. Um, and uh, he has specifically requested support from our organization and others to help address the fact that India has been hit very hard recently by the resurgence of COVID in that region and that people are out of work while they are sheltering at home and there is also extreme uh, endemic and extreme poverty that they are dealing with. Uh, he is also the leader of our, um, our march in Jammu Kashmir. Um, also want to mention the, um, uh, the work of Abdus Samad Moaz, who is the founder and head of the House of Peace Pakistan, which is in Islamabad, Pakistan, uh, spearheading work, peace work between Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs, the three main religions in that area. Um, 
they are helping to support the cause of peace in Palestine, interestingly, by raising awareness through their influence within the larger Islamic world. Uh, and interestingly, our friend there, Abdus Samad Moaz, who I have mentioned, um, he is the leader of the march there. He said he had, that he had never before met a Jew, and he, na he now has met a Jew through our organization, through me, since my background is uh, part Jewish. So being his friend and brother and being able to share with him, hey, this is a religion maybe you had no exposure to before. Maybe you heard some things about Jews that maybe wasn't too, too uh, flattering or too savory, um, but you now know one. So he's somebody who's, uh, whose work we support. Um, I also mentioned earlier Muhammad Jamuz, a young Palestinian man who lives in Jericho, and his, his profession essentially is to give tours of the Holy Land. Uh, unfortunately, he has been out of work for over a year now because of the pandemic and how it has hit uh, Palestine. So funding of the march there, because he is the leader of, of the march that we have there every year, um, funding of that march will help to bring needed funds to that region at a time when people need it the most. And even while the pandemic comes to an end, or at least comes to under control gradually, the economy in Palestine is still hampered by the socio-political strife and isolation that that region experiences. So a march in that region would, would give a boost to the morale of the people there and present the area as a symbol of peace between the three Abrahamic faiths. And that is one of the things that Muhammad Jamus works on primarily. So he has, uh, uh, he has uh, uh, led a march there in the past, and we hope to support him again in the future. Now, we have two, uh, two people who are currently, um, uh, well, one, I think one of them is online. I'm not sure if both of them are. Um, but we have uh, videos from two of them. Um, and I want to share with you um, about their work. So the first one that we have a video from is our friend and partner in uh, Lilongwe, Malawi. His name is Jafri Manasseh. Uh, he is an interfaith youth development officer of Southern Africa and also the United Religions Initiative National Director in Malawi. He is, of course, also the lead officer of the Interfaith March for Peace and Justice chapter in Lilongwe, Malawi. So we have a very short video by him that we'd like to show, just two minutes and 30 seconds, and he can say a few words about the work that he does, and then I'll share with you the next partner. Yeah, I greet you in the name of peace, joy, and harmony from the warm heart of Africa, Malawi. My name is Geoffrey Mamasi an Interfaith Youth Development Officer, Southern Africa, and the URI National Coordinator in Malawi. Uh, I simply want to come quickly and salute and thank to everyone who has been supporting uh, the program of peace marching. Uh, it has been supporting us very much, and we have been uh, doing a lot of things in Malawi. For example, we have been advocating about peace and justice to our friends who are who born albinism. Um, for several years back, we have been seeing people killing them with a lot of imagination. Uh, like some people, they still think that they can use their bones or skills to make themselves wealthy. So we have been trying to advocate that and try to strengthen peace among people and togetherness, solidarity and oneness. And we have also trying to intervene into uh, the programs of uh, uh, some dressing code of the primary schools and other things. Uh, I can say the marching has been supporting us in many ways, like to give us a platform to speak what we believe and uh, to let people know that we people, we born different and we have just to respect one another. But unfortunately this year we failed to conduct the marching because we had no funds. We tried to contribute a, a bit, but uh, we realized that our financial muscle was not capacity enough to have the, the marching. So, yeah, we were so much depressed, uh, not comfortable, affected. But we know that maybe in time to come, we are going to do it again. Uh, I really, really uh, thank to those, like I said, who used to support this program, and I still encourage those who can manage to support to do that. So maybe next year or later this year, we can at least organize the matching like uh, we normally do. Thank you very much.
Once again, I greet you in the name of peace, joy, and harmony from home heart of Africa, Malawi. Thank you. Uh, before we go on to the next video, I just want to mention a few things since, you know, we were having some, some uh, technical difficulties regarding the sound, so I don't know if you, had, uh, if you had caught what he had said about one of the particular issues in his locality was that there's still some misunderstanding about the causes of albinism um, and that some of the people in that particular area of Malawi tend to be a bit still a bit superstitious about the causes of albinism and there is a certain amount of, of oppression and, um, uh, and even violence against people born with albinism. Um, so that is one of the particular issues that his group is trying to educate people about in that area. So as I was mentioning beforehand, uh, you know, every particular locality, every region where any of our marches are, there are certain issues that um, that are important to that particular community, to that particular region. And so what we want to be able to do is to support the people who are on the ground working in that region to do what they feel they need to do in that region to make their region a bit better, to make life a little bit better. So that's one of the things that, uh, that Joffrey's group has, has uh, handled or continues to handle. Um, yeah, unfortunately, they were not able to have a march this year, of course. They were still very hard hit by COVID, but also uh, there was the issue of funding. Um, back in, I guess it was 2018, when the Interfaith March for Peace and Justice, the, the larger coalition, was still under the auspices of that Columbus-based group, they had gotten a small grant, um, and they were disseminating uh, what we were calling mini-grants to the different communities. And so particularly the international marches uh, had received a, a, a modest grant from uh, the Interfaith March for Peace and Justice, uh, but that grant was not renewable, the, the original source grant. So after we had absorbed the Interfaith March for Peace and Justice community, we weren't able to continue giving grants to Joffrey's group, to other groups, and that's what we'd like to resume. So that's one of the things that we're trying to focus on right now. So um, I want to ask Vishal if we could please play the next video, which is from uh, Isa Toha Shamsu. He is the executive director of African Students for Interfaith Tolerance, or ASFIT, um, in Ghana, West Africa. And they are actually our newest march. He is the lead officer of the Interfaith March for Peace and Justice chapter in Ghana, and they just joined up with us actually a couple of months ago. So they haven't, haven't had a march yet, but they want to this year. Um, he is a, a young man who just graduated college. He is just a, an incredible leader, incredibly well-spoken. I have so much respect for him, um, and so I want to share a short video from him, and if he has uh, internet connectivity right now, if he's on, we'd like to maybe just speak with him for a moment or so. So I'll turn that over to Vishal. Hi, the president of Institute for Religious Tolerance, Peace and Justice, Dr. Greenberg, members of the Global Interfaith Marches, religious leaders, fellow peace builders and interfaith activists, and everyone present. I extend to you warm greetings of peace and blessings from Ghana. On the occasion of Summer International Music, Dance and Art Festival, it is a great pleasure and an honor done me by Dr. Eric Greenberg and the Institute for Religious Tolerance, Peace and Justice to participate and also share lessons of our interfaith organization. I am Isato Hashamsu, the founder and executive director of African Students for Interfaith Tolerance, a registered youth-led peace-building organization. Our organization was formed at during the trying times of 2019, in which we saw cowardly, distasteful, and horrible manifestation of hate and violent extremism, first in New Zealand and in Sri Lanka, both in the year 2019. In college, I was wondering what I could do to counter these clear manifestations of violent extremism, and that is why I came together with fellow young people to found this organization simply known as Art Fit. As Fit. For the past few years of our operation, we have organized an interfaith dialogue, we've organized intergenerational dialogues, we've also launched fellowship programs, we've launched um, several programs um, to mark our work and to promote our vision and mission. I'm very happy 
and to read about the incredible work of Institute for Religious Tolerance, Peace and Justice, especially in the institution of micro grants to support the organization of interfaith matches across the globe. More than ever, we need to connect, collaborate, and strengthen our efforts in peace building to give hope, inspire hope, uh, bring light, and create a safe space for people across the globe to feel safer and more inclusive. Thank you so much once again, and I'm grateful to the Institute for Religious Tolerance, Peace, and Justice and Dr. Greenberg for the opportunity to share a few remarks at this important event. Thank you once again. So he's on? Okay, great. So, um, so Isa, I don't know if you can hear me, but we have you online right now through Zoom, and I want to welcome you, and I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, meet with us, and maybe we can just speak for just a moment or so, and, um, you know, if uh, maybe you just kind of chat a little bit more about some of the issues that are, uh, you know, that are affecting Ghana and some of the, the issues that, that ASFIT is focusing on. So uh, let me know if you can if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you um, loud and clear. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Greenberg, and um, to the crew and to everyone present today. Um, I'm excited to be here with you. And um, just like I said in the video, we are a youth-led organization working to address. Um, differences that exist in terms of religious beliefs that sometimes people misunderstand each other and it fuels hate and uh, violent extremism. Um, so, so far we have been uh, working around that area and I got to learn about your work at the Institute, especially with regards to the, uh, the interfaith solidarity matches that, that you do organize uh, globally. And I got interested about that. So I'd like to commend you and the team for the grants that you do give. Um, I'd like to share my screen briefly, just to uh, show you some few things about us. Um, um, so in this picture, we brought together these young people to interact with religious leaders and the elderly, uh, to have that intergenerational, intergenerational dialogue on how we can strengthen interfaith and cultural harmony among the youths. So these are some couple of pictures about the event. And here was a radio station I went to, uh, a local radio station in my community to educate people on COVID-19 and how we can um, collaborate to promote peace and strengthen interfaith and intercultural harmony um, among people. Then here we, we launched um, our Young Peace Builders Fellowship Program which offers young people an opportunity to be trained by experts of peace building dialogue um, and how they can be able to come together and mobilize and form coalitions to work for peace and development, um, just so we create that inclusive environment for all. So I'd like to commend once again, uh, um, the Institute and Dr. Greenberg for the work we have, we have been doing in terms of not only um, working within your uh, community, but extending a hand to everyone across the globe and trying to bring in more people. Um, we are so happy that we, 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 you are doing this kind of work because we need a lot of um, sustained and, uh, efforts um, in trying to make this world a better place for everybody. So we are happy that you are doing that and we commend you and the team. Um, and we hope that we can equally join hands to amplify voices of your, your voices and many other voices that are doing these works so that we can all uh, build a more sustainable, resilient, and inclusive um, community. So you can see here, we had uh, this traditional leader and a pastor here who were sharing ideas, especially if you look at the background, we have the sustainable development goals that they spoke about, how the community can rally behind each other in solidarity and join hands to um, promote uh, development, inclusive development for everybody. So right now we have the COVID-19 vaccines and misconceptions. So we are currently trying to work around that and ensure that we get a lot of people taking the vaccines so that we can be able to build back better and we can be able to have everybody being safe. So just in case you are wondering, um, these are uh, our, our handles in case you just want to learn more about us. 
um, Aspid website is there, the social media handles and everything. Um, I would like to say a very big thank you to Doctor and the Institute once again for the invitation and for the opportunity to say a word. Um, I'm so excited and I am thrilled by the performances. And uh, I don't know, I'm just very happy that I have been able to make it to this particular event. Um, thank you so much once again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you so much, Isa. I very much appreciate your time. Um, so I just want to mention that we can't assure that every specific march that has been part of our community in the past will be funded in the next year because every march needs to apply annually for the grants and our grants committee give funds to where they are needed the most. But we want to make the mini grants program available to our partners this year so that they can be better able to handle the peripheral costs of a march such as government permits, security, food and refreshments, banners and branding, and the like. There are all sorts of peripheral costs that marshes, uh, you know, have to, to, to handle. Um, but if you want to adopt a particular march, we can do our best to shift the funds in that direction. But as I said, we can't make any promises. Um, but no matter where your funds go, they will be supporting some of the finest people that I have ever met, doing some incredible work in their particular locations. Um, so, once again, I want to thank everybody for being here and for buying tickets to this event, which of course uh, support the work that we do. Um, and only you know your finances, only you know what you're able to give, but I do want to ask you to please think about giving just a little bit more. Think about people like Isa, think about people like Mohammed Jamus, think about people like Joffrey, any of the people who have been part of our marches in the past, who will be part of our marches again in the future, who need just a little bit of extra support from us on a financial level. Um, think about that. Uh, and of course, even people here in the United States who, uh, you know, even if we're not giving them uh, financial contributions, just the ability to support them in some way, it takes a lot, a lot of infrastructure to run basically two dozen marches. So in some way, your dollars are gonna be going towards something good. So I wanna remind you of that. So, you know, these are heroes that we're working with. People like Joffrey, people like Issa, people like uh, Sylvia Achan and Mohammed Jamus. Um, but you're also heroes by being here, by supporting this. So, once again, any way that you're able to give, whether it's by check or PayPal, we also have some envelopes here. Um, just want to ask you to consider what you can do. And maybe if not today, then another day in the future. But we do have the 2022 Interfaith Solidarity March coming up um, May 22nd of 2022. The date has been announced. Uh -huh. So, uh, and that our, our International Planning Committee had uh, come to that decision very recently. So we now have a date. We've got it on the books. We hope to have it in person here in Los Angeles. All the other regions around the world will decide for themselves how they want to do it. I'm assuming most of them will be uh, open to having it in person again. Um, but anyway, every dollar that you contribute is building something. It's building a community of people who are better able to support each other and bring peace and justice and understanding to the world. So once again, I'm gonna turn the microphone back over to Damien and we will be able to enjoy the last couple of performers for the day. So thank you again for bearing with our technical issues and all of that. Thank you. Okay. Well, first of all, how many of you here have decided to give a little extra to the institution? I'm actually going to give. I'm going to give a little extra myself. I'm a volunteer, but I'm going to do that. Thank you. Raise your hands again. That is awesome. Thank you so much. OK, well, we have two last performers. Um, to wrap up today, and then afterwards, we have a wonderful little um, palette of food, snacks, a little bit of uh, wine for those who would like some of that. Um, we are wrapping our festival with two artists. The next performer is the owner of the Los Angeles Belly Dance Academy, a premier dance studio located in the heart of Los Angeles. She's an acclaimed choreographer, award-winning performer, and Hollywood actress. She can be seen on screen in numerous national and international commercial campaigns, television shows, and films. Please welcome Stefania, accompanied by Jasmine, 
and Sarah Alma.
Can you imagine the amount of skill and practice to do that? Anyway, truly amazing. We have our final performer for the evening. Um, he's a professional musician, musician and owner of the After Midnight Band. With a career spanning three decades, he's performed as a band leader, keyboard, and lead vocalist at over 2,000 events. Uh, Mark Kaufman is also the co-owner of Avo Cafe in Santa Monica, an all-vegan organic cafe on Pico Boulevard, which I'm very much looking forward to joining him over there and enjoying some vegan pizza, which I've heard is quite excellent. Uh, please welcome Mr. Mark Kaufman. Well, it looks like I'm closing out the live performance part of the show. No pressure. Well, the content tonight I chose is quite light, but lively. And uh, I usually perform with a live band, but tonight I have uh, a band coming out of my iPhone. And uh, readers that Kind of make me look like I'm trying to set a stage image. All right, so take it away, Maestro. Thank you. Ooga, shaka, ooga. 
All right, I chose this next song because my son performed it at his fifth grade promotion. So uh, I thought maybe I'd join him on this one. Take it away. I can't stop this feeling deep inside of me. Girl, just don't realize what you do to me when you hold me in your arms so tight. Let me know. Everything's all right. I hooked on a feeling. I found believing. You're in love with me. Lips all sweet as candy. Tastes on my mind. Girl. When you're all alone, keep it up, girl. Yeah, you turn me on. I hooked on a feeling. I'm high on believing. You're in love with me. I'm hooked on. Thank you. For the last song, we got something from the 2000s. Homegrown alligator, see you later. Gonna hit the road, gonna hit the road. Something changed in the atmosphere, architecture unfamiliar. Will I get used to this? You know, time flies by in the yellow and green. Stick around and you'll see what I mean. There's a mountain top that I'm dreaming of. If you need me, you know where I'll be. Well, I'll be riding shotgun on a lethal hot song, feeling like a someone. I'm riding shotgun on the need the hot song, feeling like a someone. Where's the equator navigator? Gonna hit the road, gonna hit the road. Deep sea diving around the clock, bikini bottom lager tall. Well, I get used to this. You know the time flies by in the yellow. Stick around and you'll see what I mean. There's a mountain top that I'm dreaming of. If you need me, you know where I'll be. Well, I'll be riding shotgun underneath the hot sun, feeling like a someone. I'll be riding shotgun underneath the hot sun, feeling like a someone, someone, someone. 
got two in the front, two in the back, sailing along, and we won't be back, 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 back. Time flies by in the yellow and green. Stick around and you'll see what I mean. There's a mountain top that I'm dreaming of. If you need me alone, where I'll be? Well, I'll be riding shotgun underneath the hot sun, feeling like it's someone, someone. I'll be riding shotgun underneath the hot sun, feeling like it's someone, someone. I'll be riding shotgun underneath the hot sun, feeling like it's someone. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Very honored to be asked to do this and very happy to have lent support and give it back to your MC. Okay, good. Let's give it one more round of applause for Mr. Mark Kaufman. <laughs> Closing out the evening tonight. So as I said, this does bring our event to a close. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being an excellent audience and doing a great job of keeping your end of the bargain for being a loud and boisterous audience. Uh, thank you all, everyone who joined us from home, uh, watching this, enjoying this at home here. Um, I also want to thank again the sponsors who provided the energy for this. Uh, I also want to thank Father Michael Foley and the Vestry, the Holy Nativity Episcopal Church for the use of their beautiful sanctuary. If you are not already familiar with this place, please come up here afterwards. Enjoy the artwork. It's truly amazing. Um, there is also, I, I want to bring up everyone who helped to make this possible. And Dr. Greenberg, Melissa, volunteers. Let's see, we have uh, Roxanne, Dolly, Robin, Vishal. Uh, we have Jimmy. Uh, Ellen, Leonor, not all of them are here, by the way. Come on up, come up here. Everyone who made this possible, Vishal, at least stand up, be acknowledged right there. Jimmy, production team, there's Robin right there on camera. Melissa, who's in the back, come on up here, come on. Actually, there's even more that I that are not here today that made this all possible. Thank you all very much. Give them all a warm round of applause. Today. All right. Well, there is food outside for all of you. Um, I look forward to seeing you at our next seminar or festival. At the very least, I look forward to seeing you on May 22nd at the 2022 Interfaith Solidarity March right here in Los Angeles. Remember, love and help others. Your life will be better for it. Thank you all and good night.